this feeling that something was terribly wrong with the world that we live in, but you couldn't figure out just what it was. Then you've come to the right place. Secret societies, mystery religions, and the Illuminati have been controlling our reality since the beginning of time. But not anymore, because there is an awakening happening, and you are about to become a part of it. I want to take you right now to an important segment that we did in an interview with archaeologist E. Raymond Kapp. I believe it's going to bless your heart. Uh, that kind of fits in with what we want to do here. And ladies and gentlemen, I want to welcome you to uh, this special interview. We're at the home of archaeologist E. Raymond Kapp. Mr. Cap, it is indeed a pleasure to be with you here. My pleasure too. And to share with us uh, some interesting things concerning uh, the covenant people and and their migrations. Now, I want to begin with going back a number of years ago to a special interview you could, did with Pastor Sheldon Emery, and he did a film. Do you remember that interview? I, and do you, do you remember I, the name of that film? Heirs of the Promise. I remember it clearly. Right. That was the, at that time, there was only a handful of ministers in America, I would guess less than 25, that were not glossing over or ignoring the Old Testament in their preaching. Yet we know four-fifths of the, old, of the Word of God is found in the Old Testament. And that is the basis and foundation of the teachings of Jesus Christ. Well, Pastor Sheldon and me was one of those few, a little handful of ministers that did not gloss over the Old Testament. No, he didn't. Hello, I am Pastor Sheldon Emery of Lord's Covenant Church of Phoenix, Arizona. Mr. Cap with our questions. This interesting little marble head was found in the vicinity of Ephesus in Turkey. Is that an identifiable historical figure? Well, at the present time, we have not identified him, but we hope to do so. I would suggest he's of the Byzantine period, about the 4th or 5th century AD. And it brings back fond memories of those times. Well, his interview of me gave me the opportunity to bring to a Caucasian Americans the archaeological evidence that they are the lost tribes of Israel. And of course, I, in that interview, I dealt with the captivity and the migrations of Israel based on archaeology. So the question boils down to this. What did happen to the millions, yes, millions of Israelites, who were driven out of Palestine 700 years before Christ? And where were they? if they existed at all, at the time Paul uttered his statement of confidence in God keeping his promises to Israel. Can we find out what happened to them so that their descendants can be identified in the world today? For a visual answer to that question, we are going to call on E. Raymond Kapp, a Bible student and biblical archaeologist from California. Mr. Kapp has traveled and studied extensively in Europe and the Mideast, he lectures on the Dead Sea Scrolls, on the pyramids of Egypt, and on other archaeological subjects. Mr. Cap is the author of books on the Great Pyramid, on astronomy and the Bible, on Stonehenge of England and Druidism, on Solomon's Temple, on ancient Israel, and he has written an excellent Bible study on the Abrahamic Covenants. Now to Mr. Cap with our question. As a minister, I know there is an abundance of prophecy concerning the destiny of Israel, but there is no Bible history of this portion of Israel referred to in 2 Kings 17.6. In the ninth year of Hosea, the king of Assyria took Samaria and carried Israel away into Assyria and placed them in Hela and in Habor by the river of Gozan and in the city of the Medes. The Bible history of this major part of Israel ends here, and yet the prophets and the New Testament promise an increase in numbers, great blessings, and an eventual restoration. With the passing of 2,500 years since this Assyrian captivity, one might think that all hope of tracing these Israelites is lost. Ray, can archaeology answer this question? Yes, Pastor Emery, it has. During the last hundred years, a number of archaeological teams have been working in the Middle East, 
They have unearthed and published the original contemporary account of the Syrians who took the Israelites captive. It is from these records that vital clues have come to light. In fact, these records are found in the form of cuneiform tablets, such as I show you here. These were found at Nineveh in 1900 and published in 1930. However, their relevance to Israel was overlooked then because they were found in complete disorder and amongst about 1,400 other texts. The tablets were Assyrian frontier post reports dated about 707 B.C. They described the activities of a people called Gamira, who lived in the land of Gamir. The descriptions of Gamir described the area the Israelites had been placed just a few years earlier. They were called Masagedi and Saka. Archaeology has solved two of the greatest archaeological problems. First, what happened to the hundreds of thousands of Israelites who disappeared south of the Caucasus? And second, the origin of the Sumerians and the mysterious nomadic tribes known as Scythians who suddenly appeared north of the Caucasus both the same time in history. They were one and the same people. They were Israelites. Our history books pick up the story at this point, recording the westward migrations of the Scythians as they came into collision with the Sumerians, who had earlier settled west of the Black Sea. Their kinship lost over the centuries. The ensuing battles forced the Sumerians west and north to become the Celts, Gauls, and Cimbri. By the end of the 4th century B.C., the Scythians had established themselves as the great and prosperous kingdom of Scythia. Later, the, the Sarmatians, these were a mixed uh, non-Israelite people of Iranian origin, they in turn drove the Scythians northwest to the shores of the Baltic Sea. At this time in history, we find the Romans introduced the name German in place of the name Scythian in order not to confuse the Scythians with the Sarmatians now who occupied Scythia. Germanus, uh, being the Latin name for genuine, indicates the Germans were the genuine Scythians. During this time, the Celts were expanding in all directions from Central Europe. Some of the Celts moved into Spain and became known as Ibrius, the Gaelic name for Hebrews. Others poured into Britain to form the bedrock of the British race. Later, the Ibrius moved into Ireland as Scots, and later into northern Britain to establish the nation of Scotland. Your history books also record the Germanic tribes breaking up into many divisions, the Angles, Saxons, Jutes, Danes, and Vikings, to name just a few. Other Germanic tribes later poured into the lands vacated by the Celts and established the Gothic nations, the Vandals, Lombards, Franks, Burgundians, and others. The so-called lost tribes of Israel were really never lost. They only lost their identity as they migrated westward over the centuries from the land of their captivity. And there you have it, my friends. Mr. Cap has given us a visual answer to our question, what happened to the millions of Israelites who were dispersed out of old Canaan land seven centuries before Christ and who never returned? They migrated onto the continent of Europe and were the ancestors of the white European race. And in answering our question about Israel's disappearance, Mr. Cap has given us the key to several other mysteries of world history. We're not told this in our present day history books. Because they, they don't realize who they are. They, they're a continuity of the tribes of Israel from captivity migrating west. Because of the captivity, and when you're in captivity, you don't have any say-so of your name, you don't have any say-so of of where they're going to put you, and they they gave the tribes of Israel different names, didn't they? Yes, they also had some freedom. A lot of people imagine they went there as slaves, slave masters, beating them, making them work to death. No, no, no. They were actually moved in that area. You got to think about something else. They were not slaves in the Syrian captivity. Let's get that straight. They were actually taken over there and let them build their own cities. Uh, they might move them out of the country. They couldn't declare war. They're in a strange area. Because their captors knew they'd be far more productive that way. And productive, too. And uh, they allowed to have their own government. But they had to pay certain their royalty, I guess you might call it that, or other economy, to the crown. And they're mainly, they were buffers to protect the borders around Assyria. They weren't there to, to become slaves. They wanted to buffer out there. 
in those days, they were fighting each other. And Their feeling was, if you had a, a, these uh, Israelites around them, and anyone coming against them had to go through them first. And of course, they would fight, the, fight, and that's what happened. We have records in the archaeological tablets describing these the very events happening. You covered uh, well, some, some fascinating things about Israel when you were touring Britain, and you were actually uh, uh, in a British museum there, and you found some interesting things about Israel's history. Well, there. I was able to identify some tablets found in the British Museum. They were made by the Assyrians who took the Israelites captive. And that, uh, so I don't say I didn't discover it, I just identified Right. But they had not been identified before. They were mixed up among about 20,000 tablets. And uh, the, ones that, the series I worked with were uh, found in 1850 by the uh, University of Pennsylvania. And I mean, it was 1930 before they were translated. And they, what they did, they had 20,000 tablets. That's a lot of tablets. Yes, what they did, is. first they did, they, they, all the ones that had a name of Ashbanapal, Sargon, all these uh, Nebuchadnezzar, these um, king lines of Assyria, they laid on one side. You know, there were 1,470 of them. Now, the, Professor Waterman at the University of Michigan, he translated them, and he, tra every, he translated and uh, found the tablets described, uh, well, the Israelites were called different names. Uh, Gemira was one of them. Right. And another one called, called Iskuzi. And uh, Iskuzi, uh, was, the, they didn't, directly from, um, from the t Israel name was changed directly to one to the other. And then they found these in the, on the tablets. Uh, the tablets only cover a very small section of what I'm trying to overall tell you about. Uh, these, the, the Syrians who took the Israelites captive, they did keep records of them in cuneiform tablets. And they were found in the British Museum today. Like I said, I didn't discover them. I located them and uh, found that they identified them. And they describe exactly step by step how, what they did to them and how they left. Now, when they started leaving, and of course the cuneiform tablets drop off, don't tell their losses. Right. But the uh, Greeks kept records of them, the Romans kept records of them, and they pick up the very names where the Israelites, the uh, Syrians, stopped. And so those tablets are a scientific proof, you might say. People say, well, uh, it's your interpretation of the Bible. Show me some archaeological proof. We got it. All you got to do is listen to it. And it happened. You ought to, when time came up, uh, Ratu was up near Lake Van, and they uh, were coming, raising an army, and the Syria was always worrying about them getting closer. And some of these tablets we found were spy reports. They had spies out here keeping track of what goes on, is what the Israelites are doing and what the enemy is doing. And in the seven, one tablet is actually dated 707 uh, BC, and it told about the land of Iraq to come up against the land of Israel. Uh, I should, they call them, of course, Syria, so the Khmer, uh, and how they counterattacked it, and uh, they did the job they're supposed to do. Well, there's there's a lot of history uh -huh. uh, again to to uncover. There's so much of the Bible, so much of history that uh, I should say history that relates to the Bible that people don't know anything about. They're kept in darkness. There's a lot we don't understand. People don't read history, and to know the Bible, you have to read Bible history or history of those countries to understand it properly. Amen. I want to move up to the time of Christ now. Many people don't realize there's a there's a great history that has yet to be uncovered, but you've taken the time over the years to go to many lands. I know you've been to Europe and to England, and you've uncovered some fantastic things about the early years of Jesus that perhaps we'll get a chance to get into in this interview. But one of your booklets you had a description of Jesus in it, and I'd like for you to share with us uh, mm -hmm. some information about this, because when I went to uh, the university, they told me that Jesus was probably sh some short, olive-skinned uh, Jew, and uh, when I read your description of Jesus, it's quite different. Could you elaborate? Well, this isn't my description. This is a historical record. In fact, we have one letter to to Pontius Pilate, from Pontius Pilate, to Tiberius Caesar. 
He described Christ, among other things, being taller than average, had golden colored hair and beard. Golden colored hair. And that's in the Congressional Library in Washington. Now, the other contains in much more detail. This is written by a resident of Judea. This is during the reign of Tiberius Caesar, and of course written to him. This first appeared in the writings of a saint of Canterbury in the 11th century AD. Now, when you mentioned in your letter to me that you were going to wanted to, you asked to question about, uh, did I have any descriptions of Christ that I'd published? Could I share those? I said yes. So what I did, I have a copy of it from my publications, The Resurrection Tomb. I'll read that. This is the book, by the way, The Resurrection Tomb. Uh, this man wrote, quote, There lives at this time in Judea a man of singular virtue whose name is Jesus Christ, whom the barbarians esteem as a prophet. But his followers love and adore him as the offspring of the immortal God. He calls back the dead from the graves, heals all sorts of diseases with a word or touch. Now here's the description. He's a tall man, well-shaped, amical and reverent aspect. His hair is a color that can hardly be matched, falling into graceful curls, waving about and very agreeable, crouching upon his shoulders, parted on the crown of his head, running as a stream to the front after the fashion of the Nazareth. His forehead is high, large, and imposing. His cheeks without spot or wrinkle. Beautiful with a lovely red. His nose and mouth formed with exquisite symmetry. His beard and of the color suitable to his hair. Reaching below his chin and parted in the middle like a fork. His eyes are bright blue. I'm going to picture you seeing showing dark, <laughs> clear and serene. Look innocent, dignified, manly, and mature. In proportion, a body most perfect, captivating his arms and his hands, delectable to behold. That's not a Imagine a good many of you were not aware of that description of Jesus with blonde hair and blonde locks in his hair and blue eyes. Well, that's just a small little sample of what we're going to be sharing with you. But I want to take you back now to the subject of the migrations of the tribes of Israel. The Word of God tells us that Israel wandered after their Assyrian captivity, after uh, they had become lost. History tells us that they had become lost and that they wandered into the various nations. Now, the reason I'm saying that is because the Word of God uses the word Scattering. Pastor Sheldon Emery always talked about how we were divorced, but he also brought up the fact we were going to be remarried, and in the Hebrew law, when the husband dies, the wife then can remarry. And I believe that Jesus Christ had married Israel. When he died on the cross, that fulfilled the law of release of the wife to marry again. And it yes. says in the Bible, you're going to remarry her. He said, he who scattereth Israel is going to gather Israel. <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's a tremendous love story. And Israel was scattered. Israel had become lost to their identity. And they became literally Gentilized, or another word for this could, would be paganized. They entered into idolatry. They became an idolatrous people, and they worshiped false gods. Things were not looking good for them, but this is a matter of of divine, uh, the God's hand directing his people into these various lands for his divine purposes. Now this is very important what I'm sharing with you here because the word of God tells us in a number of places such as in Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 8 that Israel would become blind, a people that are blind but would have eyes. In other words, Yes, they have eyes, but they would not be able to really see or remember their former state as Israelites. And over a matter of, let's say, centuries, it's easy to see how this can happen. And just look at the changes that's occurred in our nation in the last 200 years. We have forgotten our Christian beginnings, our great biblical heritage. Mr. Captain, I, for the life of me, can't 
understand why people will turn a deaf ear to their history and their origin. The, it, in your reading of God's word, over and over, they preserve the, the heritage, they pre preserve the, the seed line, and they write down their, the, uh, the, their family uh, origin. It's recorded over and over in the word of God. Why do you think that that, the they recorded them? The ministers are not telling the truth of the people. They don't bring out the Old Testament at all. Because they, but I want people right. to remember this. They all teach. Israel, the lost tribes of Israel, the ten tribes, moved up here, lost and gone forever. And the point I want to make out is, and show you, they did not stay there and amalgamate with the people. They migrated, migrated, migrated. And we have evidence to back that up. Much like we did here in the United States of America, when they landed here, we continued to migrate westward. Now remember, God told Israel, you get a, go into captivity, he described what's going to happen to them. We have history can prove step by step how it happened. He also said he's going to regather them. How can yes. you regather them if they're all going to be, they're gone and lost forever? And only one tribe left. He made promises to each one of those sons of Jacob. He promised them great things in the future. Now, if you just take, keep that thought in mind, how can you say they're lost and gone forever? There's something wrong here. They've been taught wrong. They migrated out and became great nations, all of them. And the word of God does explicitly t say in the book of Genesis unto Abraham, I'm going to make you a father of many nations. Not just one nation, but many nations. So we know that certainly couldn't apply to that little piece of real estate over there in Palestine. Well, it's so clear to us because we have read and studied the material. And if any of us can read and study the material available, they'll come to the same conclusion as we will. Now, in Isaiah chapter 42 and verse 16, the word of God says this to Israel, I will bring the blind by a way that they knew not, and I will lead them in parts that they have not known. And I will make darkness light before them, and the crooked things straight. These things will I do unto them, and not forsake them. Now this is long after uh, God Almighty had divorced Israel and put them away, and he's saying Though I have divorced them, and though I have put them away, I will not forsake them. And these Israelites scattered into Europe, and they became known as Scythians, Goths, the Goths, the uh, Celts, the Cumri, the Sumerians, and the Saxons. We carried on from Israel times. And what does the Sake mean? What are Saxons? They are Isaac's sons. Um, another uh, significant fact is the name Britain. Brit is from the ancient uh, word Brith, meaning covenant. Britain, meaning covenant land, or Britham, which also means people of the covenant. And British, ish, is uh, an Israelite word for man, covenant man. So covenant man, covenant people, covenant land. Um, they, were Ang uh, they were Saxons, they were Angles. And the Angles was a Hebrew name for bullocks. And bullock is the symbol of um, the tribes of Joseph. Ephraim and Manasseh uh, were described as uh, the bullocks and unicorns. A unicorn is an old name for uh, bullocks. And we have the unicorn also as a uh, symbol in our heraldry, not forgetting the lion, which is also um, part of Israel's heraldry, heraldry. The lion and the unicorn. Why should those two symbols of ancient Israel be so much a part of the heritage um, of modern Britain, for instance? Um, well, of course, because we've descended from the ancient people of Israel. Revealing quote concerning Israel. Could you share that with us, please? Yes, Sir Arthur Bland was a great uh, British historian and uh, has written uh, many, many books on history, <coughs> one of which is the history of the English-speaking peoples, which would include America, of course, as well. He covered all that. Uh, and in that, uh, in that encyclopedia, which he was a series of books, uh, he stated clearly that the Angles, the Saxons, the Danes, the Jutes, the Normans, and many other groups of people entering the British Isles in the Middle Ages right from the 5th century forward. 
he says they all can be identified as being racially of the one people. And he says they can all be traced back in their movements across Europe towards the British Isles as uh, to the very Caucasus of southern Russia, which is the very part wow. where ten tribes of Israel were carried captive. That is a fantastic And point. there's another name that they were known by as well, and I want to share with you from this particular book. It is called The Lost Ten Tribes of Israel Found by Stephen Collins. This is a tremendous book giving a great deal of history concerning Israel. And he says on page 220 that the Israelites became the Iberians and the Scythians and the Parthians. He says the Parthians were Israelites of the ten tribes of Israel who had migrated to Asia. The Bible records that these tribes were placed in the city of the Medes. And Parthia's homeland adjourned the territory of the Medes. Parthians were first under the dominion of the Assyrians, and that was also the fate of those Israelites taken captive by the Assyrians. He says that the Parthians were the kinsmen of the Scythians, or the Sakai. The Parthians and the Scythians are the people written about by Josephus. And he says that Josephus was a first century historian who lived in Rome and followed the Israelites. He made a great detailed notes of the Israelites and their migrations. And he gives this quote by Josephus, and I want to share that with you right here. He says, quote, The ten tribes, the so-called lost ten tribes of Israel, are beyond the Euphrates until now, and are in immense multitude and not to, be esti not to be estimated by number, end of quote. These Israelites weren't lost. They weren't just a small group of people, but they were in the millions, and Josephus records their history. And what we want to do is share with you some additional history on those Israelites at this time. Hi, friends. We're up here in the beautiful Rocky Mountains near the Canadian border, and I want to tell you, the scenery and the terrain here is magnificent. It reminds me of the Scandinavian countries. I don't know if you've had the opportunity to ever travel to Norway, Sweden, or Denmark, but the terrain's very similar to that up here. The air is fresh and clean. But what I want to share with you is uh, something exciting concerning the migrations of the tribe of Dan, Zebulun, Asher, uh, Simeon, you can see their marks and you can see their symbols and their banners all over the Scandinavian countries. And I have with me some books that share with you much more information on that. I'm only going to share with you a little bit that uh, of, of the information given in these books. And one of the first ones I want to share with you is a brand new book by Stephen Collins called The Origins and Empire of Ancient Israel. He shows in here that these Danites were a seafaring people and uh, takes them from the time of Judges when they were in the land of Canaan and there really wasn't all that much land for the expanding tribes of Israel. And he takes you uh, through that expansion and you'll want to get a copy of that book by Stephen Collins. The next book that I have is by William H. Bennett. It's called The Story of Celto Saxon Israel. And in this particular book here, he goes and shares with you uh, who Dan is, that he was uh, the father of obviously one of the tribes of Israel, but they cherished Dan as one of their fathers. And that's why you can still see his name and, uh, and the symbols and the banners of the tribe of Dan all over the Scandinavian countries. And also, that the Danish language, uh, the Scottish language in Ireland and, the, uh, and in Wales, the Gaelic language, there is a Hebrew connection. There's a Hebrew tie to the tribes of Israel. Correct. And uh, of Correct. they moved up into the Scandinavian countries as well? Yes, we have here the post-captivity names of Israel by William Pascoe Gord from uh, Great Britain. And uh, he tells us how that these people were identified in history as they journeyed toward the west. Now this took hundreds of years. They followed up the Danube River, 
They followed up the Don River. This is where the Danes came from because they're of Dan. And as you travel through this and you see the history of the thing, it unfolds to us and we begin to realize, oh, isn't it wonderful? Isn't it marvelous? Could I be a, a, an actual descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob of the Bible. Oh, this is glorious. This is wonderful. And Jesus Christ is real, and he's my Savior, and he's, he's my Lord, and he's going to come and save us. Amen. Isn't it wonderful? Yes, this is wonderful information. And I happen to have a copy of the Post-Captivity Names of Israel by William Pascoe Gore that Brother Southwick was referring to. And on page 38 of this book, Pascoe Gore uh, traces these ancient Israelites through the Danube River area and one of the ancient names that they used for this area was the land of Arzareth which literally means as you trace this word out the land of Israel which only brings more proof to bear that true history backs up the Word of God after all we're talking about his story And I've got a lot of material on the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's very important because they, the, dead, the covenant people know their identity as well as the Essenes, in a sense. I've heard a lot of negative things about the Essenes over the years. That, I know. It's, it's, oh, it's, it's like that's something you find in the New Age uh, books or something like that, and they, they do their best to discredit the Essenes. Obviously, there's a lot of false information well, circul circulating about the Essenes. Just the uh, general Christians, would be the Bible, should be interested in this Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, we know we're covenant people. We know our identity. As well as all Christians, we do depend on the Bible to understand God's plan for humanity, don't we? Right. We use the King James Bible text mainly, but the knowledge it does contain mistranslations. That gives us, we use concordances to make as many corrections as we can. We do that. We have several tra translations that have already made the corrections for us. Now, the King James Bible, you probably know, uses a Masoretic text right. for the basis of all its foundation. You know, the oldest copy now extant is about 900 A.D., oldest one we got, and yet it was written sometime between 1 and 300 A.D. The finding of the Dead Sea Scrolls has given us copies of Isaiah, for example, over 1,000 years older. That text going back behind the hands of several translators and it could be to check the accuracy and possibly correct our modern Bible. In fact, in my opinion, I consider the finding of the Dead Sea Scrolls one of the two most important archaeological discoveries made in the last century. The other being, of course, the finding of the cuneiform tablets in the ancient library of Sennacherib at Nineveh. These were found in 1847. These tablets reveal the history of the Israelites in Syrian captivity, and it tells all about their escape to come to become the Anglo-Saxon, Scandinavian, Celtic, and kindred people. They're keeping pretty quiet about this. Yeah. And most importantly, they show that we are the people of the Bible and revealed our past and our future. In fact, one newly translated scroll uh, I want to see put in publication is called The Words of the Luminaries. This is a, a series of prayers the Essenes uh, were praying, and they, I'll quote part of it now. We thank God for remembering his covenant, coming again, in all the lands where he has exiled them. And he goes on to talk about going to get them back again. Now, this is about, they wrote that about uh, 150 years uh, AD, no, uh, BC, 150 years BC, they wrote the scroll. Now, the, our bleeding theologians tell us in 721 B.C., they lost and gone forever, never again emerged in world history. And yet the Essenes 100, 500 years later knew where they were. We, we, we knew this. We studied Paul. Paul knew where they were. His gospel, you've recorded Colossians and the other. Wasn't that fantastic? Mr. Cap shared with us some fascinating information concerning the Dead Sea Scrolls that I'm sure many of you were not aware of. And this is true history. And we believe that true history will complement God's word. There's no conflict at all.
there's some additional history that we would like to share with you concerning the migrations of Israel and the early development of the Christian church in Europe. Some went to Asia Minor, and of course, like quite a few of them went to France. That's where we traced the, uh, I think there's a book written called Coming of the Saints. I think you handled that one time. Coming of the Saints, written by John Taylor, explained how the disciples of Christ, after the crucifixion, uh, they had to flee for their lives, and many of them went to uh, France, Mary Magdalene, Mary uh, Cleopas, uh, Lazarus, uh, Jakea, quite a few of them went to France. In fact, we have evidence of, of being there. Now, when you're talking about Lazarus, you're talking about the man that Jesus raised from the dead? Raised from the dead. And he, you know, he's actually the first uh, bishop of the Marseille Cathedral. And they know it back there. Why America doesn't even know half what the French people know about their own people? That is interesting because the different races out there seem to know where they came from. They know their identity, but the white people seem to be very <laughs> ignorant of their history and their true identity. Mm -hmm. They have a, a grotto in France where Mary Magdalene did her ministry. I was in it. <laughs> you, were there, you were actually there. Yeah. But let's be honest about it. Uh, we know she was in a grotto in that area, the bomb area, but we, I was in that grotto, and it can't be the right one. Many times we have the correct story, but the wrong location. Uh, the grotto, by the way, is a very large one, and today it's full of icons and uh, altars. Rome took over. It's been paganized then. Paganized, but that is no. The water drips from the ceiling all the time. It's sopping wet in there. She would have died of pneumonia in a short time. <laughs> Actually, it's on all, uh, quite a ways up the hill, too. Yeah. And there's no place to grow anything, no water up there, except this natural spring dropping the, on the ceiling. Now, I believe she was there, but it had to be down in the bottom where the, this cavern's down at the bottom, too. They picked the wrong location. Well, you talked about uh, Mary Magdalene. What about Mary, the mother of Jesus? Okay, after they were there for some years, Joseph Arimathea took Mary and another group of disciples and left France and went to England. Now, who's Joseph of Arimathea? The great uncle of Jesus. Right. The uncle of Mary. Now, the Bible doesn't say too much about him. He's a rich man who gave his tomb for Christ to be buried in. The guy to France, another interesting point I noticed. Uh, I did a film on that, Coming of the Saints. You ever heard of the little shopkeeper, no, the little tax man, Zacchaeus? Zacchaeus, right. Zacchaeus, up in the tree when Christ walked by. Uh, he was with the group that went to France. And when they got there, they sort of split up. Each of them started, they started, they had a message to tell the world. They had a message. They had been dedicated. They, they saw, witnessed the resurrection of Christ. It's the greatest they message were, they in were, the world. They were tied, you know, really accurate. They knew the Bible was, the story of Christ was correctly. But they went to, uh, he went to a little town up in the hill, mountains. I was up there, uh, and they loved him. He, was, he did missionary work up there. And when he died, they changed you know, the name of the town to Rockamador, because his name was changed before that to Amador, from Zacchaeus to Amador, which means the loving one. He's very, they love, they love him. And his, his tomb is up there. Uh, is it Mary buried in Glastonbury? I believe she is. Uh, the, these records, of course, are not in the Bible. They're in historical records. Now, not, not everything, not all history is found in the Bible. But it, it, what you do find, history, it always correlates. It doesn't conflict the Bible. It fits in. Now, this history certainly does show that the Christian faith moved westward, northward and westward and became the stronghold of Europe and the white race. We can trace the, these Western European nations, uh, many of them, their, their background is Scythian, Germanic, meaning genuine, and Celtic. Uh, we can trace them right back to archaeology now to the Assyrian captivity. No question at all if a person's willing to look. Um, my name is Catherine Jane Cameron Sage. 
and I live primarily in Carmel, California on the Monterey Peninsula. My second home is in Glastonbury, England in Somerset, and um, that's who I am. <laughs> I wanted to just say that um, that uh, Glastonbury, England is, is very near and dear to me because um, not only do I anciently descend from the people in Glastonbury, um, and why is that important, is because they were, um, let's uh, put it that they were the first century Christians in the British Isles. Tradition of Glastonbury uh, brings in the missing years of Christ. I went to Palestine as a young boy. Uh, about the age of 12 years old, his earthly father, Joseph the Carpenter, evidently died. Now, Joseph of Arimathea's great uncle would have charge of him be the next of kin. And he was a famous uh, metal mer mer merchant and had ships going back and forth between Joppa and uh, Rome and Britain. In fact, many people don't realize he was a Roman provincial senator and the providence was Britain. You see, Joseph of Arimathea, or Aramala, was um, known in many, many records to the first century as the Great Marmor, which is a um, very unusual title because it was associated with mining and he was also called the Nobilis de Curio in Latin, which meant the noble miner or somebody of a noble stature uh, associated with mining. You see, Joseph of Arimathea uh, mined tin uh, in Cornwall, England, and much of Somerset today. And that was all the, the Duchy of Cornwall in ancient times. And Glastonbury, England, you'll hear many people tell you that the tour in Glastonbury, England has a step pyramid shape and all that. No, it, it, the tour is shaped like that because that's the way you mined the hill in steps. It was a mining. But when earthly father Joseph died, uh, di Christ disappears from the Bible, and the mother disappears, and it's 18 so-called missing years. Right. We have historical records in Britain that Joseph took the, the boy, his mother, to Glastonbury, England. And why Glastonbury? Because he'd been going there for years, trading the lead and tin of the Mendit Hills. He was in charge of the mining district there. And we know that we don't know how long Christ stayed there. Mary then built a church, uh, I should say a home, which later became a church when she died. And she's buried someplace around Glastonbury. She lived about 15 years before she passed away. Is to understand that there are old established links, biblically evident links between ancient Israel in the Middle East and the British Isles and northwest of Europe. And those links were established back in the times of the early kings, Saul, David, and Solomon in particular. Uh, in fact, you could say that the British Isles was actually an Israelite colony going back all those centuries before. The Israelites have always been explorers. Absolutely. And uh, so Joseph of Arimathea was a wealthy mine owner. And in Cornwall to this day, they actually sing a song. Joseph was a tin man, right. and uh, there are records there, and even ordinary people down in Cornwall actually will refer to Joseph of Arimathea um, because they, they know all about that history. They are well aware uh, that Joseph evidently had a home there as well as in Palestine, and uh, the links are very, very strong and very, very real. We also have books that told after when Christ... Um as you did, the disciples of Christ uh, left France. That's when Joseph the Arimathea took Mary and another group of disciples that were in that area and went to England. So th there was this period of time that he was in, they, they were in France, and many of them stayed there, and Ewan's coming in. Right. Uh, he took them and went to Great uh, England in Glastonbury, and that's where he went back to the house where he had established a home for Mary and Lord Jesus uh, years before. And uh, we know the records show that uh, uh, Mary lived about 15 years before she passed away. And the little house 
that she lived in, they converted into a chapel. And that became the Kaldi Church. They built an uh, actually round, uh, uh, round chapel. They don't build a regular rectangular chapel. And that became the Kaldi Church, or Church of the Refugees. Joseph of Arimathea um, figured in much in the Holy Scripture stories. But you see, Mary, the mother of the Lord, um, could not clearly have remained with John, although jurisdiction, what to do for Mary uh, and her being taken care of was given to John at the cross. But John, of course, was exiled later on at the Isle of Patmos. He did not have Mary with him. Mary was given to the jurisdiction of Joseph of Arimathea, probably by the Apostle John, and taken to the British Isles, to Glastonbury, which she had already been there many times because her own son, Jesus of Nazareth, was taken there by his great uncle um, to Glastonbury at the age of 12, residing for many years because, of course, the house of David, the throne of David, was there in the British Isles. Why wouldn't Christ um, be educated where the throne of David is? Glastonbury became a very sacred spot. In fact, it was the, the land had been given to Joseph Arimathea when he first landed there. Really? And uh, we have that in a record in the Doomsday Book. They uh, gave him 12 hides of land. It's a matter of record. An interesting note that they made it tax-free. Historical confirmation of the 1900 acres of land mentioned in the traditions. It is found in the famous Doomsday Book of Britain. Domus Dei, the great monastery at Glastonbury called the Secret of the Lord. This Glastonbury church has in its own villa 12 hides of land which have never paid tax. This is the beginning, I believe, of where cemetery property became tax-free at the first time when they made that land him. Interesting. You read actually about uh, many of the people that were in the first century church in Great Britain in, in the Holy Scriptures. Um, you read about Pudens and Claudia and those people, and they were um, actually, at the time, they were in Rome at the Roman Britannicum. But um, Claudia was actually a British princess, and Linus, the first bishop of Rome, was actually a British prince. And that um, they were all part of the original um, church in the first century. There was a person named Linus, don't know much about him. It was there before P Peter. Now that is a confession <laughs> that I didn't, didn't expect to hear. So Linus was the first bishop of Rome. And Christ Not of the present Catholic Church. Or no. Right. In fact, was, remember, it was some years before the Catholic Church became known as the uh, under a head of a pope. In fact, in Britain, I think about 400, 400 years A.D., when Augustine came to Britain, and uh, that's the man's name I'm trying to think of this morning. Augustine came to Britain, and he saw the church wrought without human hands by the hands of Christ himself for the salvation of people. That would be the Cody church we talked about. Right. But now, Augustine, he, he, went to, he was sent to uh, England to get the church there. The univer they were called Catholic, meaning universal. They were not under Rome. And they, he, he demanded that the church in uh, Britain defer to Rome, the Pope, as the head church. And we have complete records of that in these books that tell how they, def they said, well, we'll defer to him as any one Christian to another. But as for this man, John, who now calls himself Pope, we owe no allegiance. Jesus Christ is our vicar. Amen. And they've been independent. In fact, uh, I mentioned Iona being a sacred place. Sometime I'll talk about Iona in and Scotland, the Clums, Scotland. Scotland, the Cumming Church, and how the Clumian monks are the ones that uh, had charge, you might say, of Christianity in Britain and uh, at that, that time, and how Rome uh, took over and got them under the legions of the Rome, the Pope. So the Pope is not the, in the first century, quite a few years before they called him Pope. He was a bishop of Rome, and when they had the Bishop of England, a Bishop of Britain. So there's a there's a ba vast history, though, that uh, many people, again, are not aware of, of 
uh, our the Christian roots and where mm-hmm. the uh, the uh, children of Israel migrated to, and the uh, Christian foundation. And it it's hard to look at this history and not and not think about the fact that see, the disciples didn't go into. Uh, China. They didn't go into Asia. They didn't go into the deepest parts of Africa. They went where the lost tribes of Israel were located at. They went to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Jesus, just as Jesus said, I have not come but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Mm -hmm. And Paul understood this. This is part of his calling as well, going into the Gentiles, meaning Nation. Nations, <laughs> not Jewish. Jesus, I mean, God Almighty told Abraham, "I'm going to make you a father of many nations," didn't he? Mm-hmm. And this term "nations" is "goy" in the uh, Hebrew, in the mm-hmm. Greek, it's "ethnos." Same word. He's sending. Uh, he was sending Paul unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel, who had been divorced and be, had become paganized, and all hope seemed to be lost for them. But then Uh here comes a new covenant, what Jesus accomplished upon the cross, and he has redeemed them. He's bringing both tribes back into the bonds of a new covenant. I don't know about you, Mr. Cap, but that's an exciting story of our history. And, of course, Paul, how did he get to Britain? Right. Because he got acquainted with Krakatus, and after seven years, Krakatus was allowed to go home as a a proe, He's almost like house arrest. Right. He had to promise not to ever take up arms against Rome again, and he went back home. And obviously, he invited Paul to go with him. And that's how Paul got to Britain. And we have evidence, uh, records of Paul uh, speaking to the Druids. And one of the places he spoke was a hill called Mount Lud. Right. And on Mount Lud, he made a prophecy. And that... Uh, Kings and uh, prophets, would, people would come and worship God on this mount. And that is where St. Paul's Cathedral is built today in England, right on that mount where he spoke to the Druids. Now, Mr. Cap, one of the subjects we haven't touched on very much at all is uh, St. Paul in Britain. Mm-hmm. Now, I've, I've got the Bible here in front of me, and it says that... Uh, there was an Ephesian Christian who accompanied Paul to Europe. And it's interesting that it says that because a lot of people aren't aware of the Christian faith going into Europe and, again, with the uh, Gentilized, paganized Israelites who were already there. And Jesus said he's going to bring them back under the bonds of a new covenant in Hebrews chapter 8 and verses 8 through 10. But I want to share with you this scripture verse here in Second Timothy chapter 4 and verse 21. This is Paul's closing words in uh, Timothy. Here's what he says, quote, Do thy diligence to come before winter. Eplurius greeteth thee, and Pertens, and Linus, and Claudia, and all the brethren. Now this verse has some um, great significance to it, and I'd appreciate if you just share with us some of your thoughts on what we've just read here. Well, this when he wrote the letter describing the friends of his in Rome. And some people think he never got to Rome by that time. He had definitely been there. Now, the names you mentioned, uh, Pudens and Claudia, uh, I have to go back a little bit. When Caradoc, or Caracacus, as the, English, the uh, Romans called him, was captured by the Romans in the wars in Britain, he was taken to Rome as a hostage with all his family. And among his family was his daughter, Claudia. Claudia. Only her name was Gladys in those days. The Bible, the history, Roman history is Gladys. And Linus was her brother. Those are relatives of the children of Caradoc or Caracacus. Now, during the wars, they've been going on for quite a few years between the Britons and the Romans, they had a truce one time. And during that truce, Claudius, uh, Gladys, I'll call her Gladys, married Rufus Pudens. And some, other, some of the royal family intermarried. And it's very, very strange. Now, Pudens was a general in the army fighting uh, Caracacus. 
And the last, you'd never think of them ever getting together in marriage. They didn't. Now, you mentioned it said that uh, Putin's his mother and mine. Now, we try to tell somebody that Putin's is a half-brother of uh, P uh, Paul. Right. They laugh at you. And yet, <laughs> that's what it says. He said, he said my mother, your mother and mine. Now, Paul's mother uh, hadn't been married before. And uh, so her husband's name, I can't recall right now, but we have a record of that. And so they were married. And their children, in, uh, later in marriage, became the nieces and nephews of Paul. And their home is where Paul spent his time in doing his confinement, uh, called the House of the Britons, Palace of the Britons. Where was this located now? In Rome. In Rome. Okay. Now they have found the foundations was identified some years ago, and of course a building built, built on top of it now. But the location is found, and some years ago, 10 or 15 years ago, there's a plaque there that said this is the home <laughs> where Paul stayed, Palace of the Britons. Now when he uh, he was had he was a, a captive, and instead of killing him like they did most of them, and put him in prison, he stood up in the uh, the, 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 in the Senate to uh, make declaration, and his daughter my, uh, Gladys stood up with him. Now, as far as we can find out, it's the first time a woman was allowed to speak before the the Senate in Rome, and she made an impassioned plea for her father. And she d defied him. Now, at that time, Claudia, uh, Claudius was the emperor in Rome at that time, Claudius. And he admired the smoke of this young girl. So much so, he adopted her as his daughter and changed her name to Claudia. So when the Bible mentions Claudia, that's the name that Claudius gave her. And so her aunt was also a prisoner. His she, was a, she was a very bold lady, and she very was... Bold. And they describe her in the describe in the record, very beautiful girl. Yes. And she stood up for her father. And the father, he, he defied him. He said, what glory you have killing me? Let me live and Rome will get credit for being you know, that war. He, he caught me by treachery. He didn't get me by war. Because his one of his relatives uh, double-crossed and turned his name over and where he was located to the Romans. That's how he was captured. It's a marvelous story. And uh, with this is having to do with Paul's relatives and family and friends. Yeah. Now, when Paul, when Paul uh, got acquainted, of course, with Cracus, and by the way, uh, Gladys was a Christian, and Cracus' father was Bran the, Bran the Great. He was a Christian. Now, at that time, Caradoc or Cracus was not a Christian yet, but his family were Christians and were taken to uh, Rome. Now you might be wondering how they get become Christians. Uh, because uh, Joseph Arimathea and his people are the ones that introduce Christianity to these people. Oh, okay. Caradoc's brother was the king of Aragus. Mm -hmm. And he's the one that gave Joseph Arimathea the 12 hides of land. This is the Doomsday Book in England. So that's how Christianity actually came to Rome from Britain. <laughs> 